I'll start things off with a brief intro introduction. Uh, I'm Ljubiša Bajic, uh, co-founder and CEO of TenStorrent, a Canadian company building next generation computers specialized for machine learning. And today I have the honor of being able to converse with Professor Matt Taylor, a leading expert in the field of reinforcement learning. Uh, Matt's a professor at the University of Alberta and a fellow of Alberta Machine Learning Intelligence Institute, uh, often known as AMI. Uh, Professor Taylor and myself are going to talk about uh, modern RL, how it intersects with computing machinery, uh, which seems to be a path a bit less traveled than the discussion about other branches of machine learning and how, how they kind of connect and influence uh, computing hardware and software. Uh, so we're going to try to establish, uh, you know, relevant problems in this space, discuss some potential solutions, uh, maybe look for desirable characteristics of computers for reinforcement learning. And uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it off to Professor Taylor and uh, he'll give us a, a bit of an overview of, of RL. Well, thanks, Lubisha. Please, please do call me Matt. Um, I, I am a little bit nervous because I am by no means an architecture expert. I know just, just enough to make me dangerous. Uh, but I've been, I've been doing RL, reinforcement learning, since 2003. And I got into it because it was kind of cool and fun. And now it's actually useful. So it, it's great to see the, the community actually embracing RL. So I just I looked it up. There's this conference, iClear. iClear 2021. The top keyword was deep learning. The second most uh, used keyword was reinforcement learning. So it's, it's clear that RL is now coming into its own and the idea of, of finding better use cases in, in architecture, in, in chip design and hardware design that can be targeted for RL is so exciting. So that's, what, that's one of the main reasons I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you today. So may, maybe I could start by just giving a brief overview of reinforcement learning. So the, the idea is, well, it's so in supervised learning or unsupervised learning, you just have a data set and you, you do stuff with that static data set. Maybe you get some labels from an Oracle or a person, but in general, you have a data set. Whereas in reinforcement learning, it's much more dynamic. You have this agent. So that could be a, a virtual program or a physical robot or something else. And you have this agent that is interacting with an environment over time. So the agent sees itself in a state, sees itself in some setting, then it takes an action, and then it tries to eventually maximize a reward signal. So for instance, in a video game, you could say the, the screen you see is the state, the actions are the different joystick, um, th ways you can move the joystick, and the reward might just be the score. So over time, you learn to, to maximize this reward. And you know, this is used for video games, but it's also used for real world settings like data center control, um, water treatment facilities, stock trading, so both virtual and physical implementations. And one, one of the big things I, I think we can dive into a bit later today is because reinforcement learning is interacting with the environment, you need to think about how do we make the environment run fast and how do we make the agent run fast? And it could be that you, know, you, could, you could have one agent learning how to play Pac-Man or maybe you would want 15 agents interacting with 15 Pac-Man environments simultaneously and pooling that knowledge together. So that way you could have a much better wall clock time. Or in another situation, for instance, if you're doing autonomous driving simulations, you might have one simulation and 20 agents that are learning at the same time. So there it's probably more important to speed up the agents than the simulator, but it's, it's all about finding that bottleneck and, and trying to figure out how we can make things run faster. Because some of the big successes playing video games takes you know, years, tens of years of compute to just get things working. And clearly that's, that's not attainable, certainly for academics like me, but that's, that's not attainable to most companies. And if we're going to get reinforcement learning into the hands of companies without billion dollar research budgets, one of the things that's gonna be key is reducing um, computational requirements and making compute more effective. Cool, Theo, thank you very much for that introduction. I think that really sets the stage for, for a lot of the, uh, the discussion that, uh, that we're gonna be diving into. Uh, one, one thing uh, I, I wanted to, to ask, uh, 
uh, before we move on is uh, is is there a, so you you made a statement about how reinforcement learning has really been making uh, huge strides which uh, even somebody like myself and I ha I have to kind of mirror your uh, your caveat from the beginning I I approach this discussion from the other side and I I know just enough about RL to be dangerous so it's exactly it's exactly the the, the same kind of story which I think might make for an interesting conversation uh, overall. Uh, but uh, do you think that this uh, uh, perceived uh, leap forward in, in uh, the, I don't know whether efficacy is the right word, but uh, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll use it anyway, eff efficacy of RL over the last few years is related to, to the overall uh, progress that's been seen in, um, in neural nets and the broader field of, uh, of, of machine learning? Uh, is it... Uh, or is the, or is that only one aspect of it, or or is um, is it kind of not an aspect of, at all? Like, how, how do you feel about that uh, that kind of broad question? So it's absolutely an aspect of it, but not the only thing. So there there are core reinforcement learning questions. So for instance, if I'm trying to maximize a reward signal and it's very sparse, it's going to take me a long time to learn. But if I could come up with this intrinsic reward, so if the agent was able to do things and be like, oh, that was cool. Let me learn more about that. Then this intrinsic reward might help the agent learn faster. So that's something that can apply all across reinforcement learning. But you're absolutely right. So reinforcement learning has, has a, a strong history of stealing from supervised learning. And the, the huge breakthroughs in supervised and unsupervised learning in deep learning in particular have catapulted reinforcement learning forward. So that the advances with attention and memory, just the advances, advances in deep neural networks, that has been critical. And from my perspective, it seems like a, a, a third, so in addition to better compute, better algorithms, a third thing that's really been advancing RL is the number of new people coming into the field. Because now researchers and companies are realizing that this is a mature technology. I really do need to learn something about it and it can be useful. And because of that, we're getting all of this new blood into the field, all of these new awesome ideas. And that's, I think that's going to bring us very quickly to a new level and work on really getting more people understanding reinforcement learning and getting more deployed applications of RL so that companies, more companies see how it can be useful to their, not just their bottom line, but just overall performance as an organization. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, the, the, that's great. And, and definitely, I think... Uh common to, to the entire kind of broader field of, of machine learning. So I think a, a lot of the, the hyperspeed progress uh, is being driven by the fact that uh, the, the brain trust that's been assembled behind uh, these topics is nothing short of staggering. I mean, uh, it seems like the amount of people working uh, in, in the broader field has grown by, by a factor of a thousand over the last couple of years. And, um, and another aspect of it that uh, I think is is uh, directly tied is is the infrastructural components required for these folks to to make progress and uh, that's also been progressing uh, super fast at least uh, in in uh, let's say more more general areas of machine learning so things like uh, uh, supervised learning for vision or for uh, semi supervised learning for for language but but I have to assume that uh, there's a fair amount of, of useful uh, feature and general availability of such tools that uh, that kind of carry over into RL as well, despite the, the many specific aspects to that problem. Um, I mean, I've been so, so as part of my kind of know enough to be dangerous, uh, I've been kind of viewing RL as something that's right in the middle of uh, uh, supervised learning and control systems from uh, you know, from, from from back in the day, which don't don't get a ton of airtime. I mean, it's it's an oversimplified picture, given that I think even even the idea of backpropagation to begin with was to some extent influenced by developments in control systems. So, uh, uh, Bernie Widrow from uh, from Stanford had uh, basically uh, implemented this algorithm called LMS for tuning filter coefficients, which essentially was was backprop, <laughs> like called a a different name and. Uh, so it seems like it's very hard to 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 uh, you know put a wedge and separate these things at all. But I remember distinctly 
uh, even simulating control systems required essentially massive amounts of, of manual labor to set up a, a decent model, usually in something like MATLAB. And even if you even even if you had a handful of parameters that are being tuned and really only one uh, you know error or, or reward signal that's that's being driven back to to tune them, it was a lot of work. Uh, it was weeks worth of work to to set up a, a good simulation of something controlling. Uh, a DC motor, for example, right? So like uh, it would be one control signal, one error signal, everything's pretty pretty sim simple at, at a system level where you you know you don't delve into the electromagnetics and the details of what's what's underneath the, the models for this motor. Whereas nowadays you've got endless sort of uh, software infrastructure where most of these things allow uh, duplication of this effort that I just outlined in MATLAB to happen uh, on the order of uh, of a few minutes for for somebody that's good with with, with PyTorch, for example. So it's it's all been going forward, which is which is amazing. And uh, I think uh, RL has had some very visible, very splashy moments over the last few years. So especially with these uh, game playing uh, agents that uh, uh, that have been sort of progressively put forth, controlling more and more complicated games and achieving more and more impressive results. Uh, Beating various grandmasters at uh, at games like uh, like StarCraft and and uh, and Dota, and um, uh, last question I'll ask before actually uh, moving into uh, a bit a bit more detail of this intersection of, of computing infrastructure and RL. That's that's our topic for the day. Is uh, uh, what's your favorite kind of uh, uh, recent uh, achievement of, of RL? Well, uh, I am very excited that the Royal Bank of Canada is now um, publicly disclosing they have a deep reinforcement learning agent that's doing stock trading. Wow. To me, that, I think that's that's a, a huge win for the community to show, especially in finance. My, my personal belief is that there are many banks and hedge funds and finance companies that are using reinforcement learning, but that they, they can't disclose that. So I really applaud the Royal Bank of Canada for coming out and saying, yes, we are using this technology and, and they deserve a lot of kudos for that. But one, one thing I wanted to quickly go back to is you're, you're absolutely right that people in operations research, people in control, um, people doing approximate dynamic programming, all of this is very similar settings. And right now, I think one of the reasons reinforcement learning is kind of coming out and top, and at least in terms of buzz, is because of those amazing successes by DeepMind and OpenAI on things like Go and Dota and StarCraft. And like you were saying, people now aren't so much developing their own simulations for every time they wanna get started. They're able to just download OpenAI Gym and get started playing Atari or download OpenAI Gym and Mujoko and start controlling robots. So now there's a, a much lower entry, much lower bar for entering the field of reinforcement learning which again, I think is gonna compound the number of people that uh, develop this know-how and advance the field accordingly. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And, and I really like the, the RBC example cause it's, uh, it's such a departure of, uh, of the previously much publicized game playing um, agents. So it, it went from, um, I, I guess it seems like your, your, your field went from, from being extremely convincing at playing complicated games, which is impressive in you know, itself, to in some way the complete opposite end of the spectrum, where you're you're essentially having reinforcement learning agents make decisions that are uh, manipulating cold cold hard cash, and uh, um, there's not a whole lot that really makes the the step from from kind of simulations and games to to uh, to the real world as uh, as this example. Well, and that and that's a great point because if DeepMind is able uh, was one of the first the first um, companies to or or anyone to get agents that could outperform people at Atari using deep learning, and you know outperforming a person at Atari that's that's pretty cool. But the stock market is so hyper optimized, and being able to beat uh, the these quants who have extensive knowledge and so much time and so much motivation to be able to beat uh, to to succeed in a setting like that is is I think really exceptional. Yeah, it, it it certainly is. It's it's an extremely impressive example, one that I I didn't know about up until today. 
we can take the conversation a little bit uh, towards the 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 kind of uh, intersection between uh, RL and uh, RL trends and RL, RL requirements for uh, for computing infrastructure and where that world uh, is today. And uh, uh, as um, as an intro to, to 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 this line of thought, uh, I was wondering if you could give a uh, like a 30 second overview of the various components of a typical RL system, how, how this usually hooks up together today, and uh, maybe uh, a sentence uh, or two about, uh, let's say, computational characteristics of, of each, uh, each one of them. Yeah, so it's, it's really thinking about these two components. So you have the simulator, which could be trivial, or it could be extremely complicated. And if it's extremely complicated, then, then you're going to need to optimize that on its own. And then you have the agent or agents. And typically, let me see if I can, I can say this. Often the biggest problem with learning is getting data from the environment. And then once you have that data, often doing the actual learning, doing the backprop, running, running the GRU, something like that, that often takes relatively little time. But in some cases, if you have an exceptionally deep neural network, or if you have a sophisticated attention mechanism, then training the agent can absolutely take a lot of time. One of the other things I should mention is one of the techniques in reinforcement learning is called experience replay. So I was saying, you know, it can be kind of slow interacting with the environment relative to doing updates. So one thing you can think about doing is storing some data, storing some interactions with the environment and using it multiple times. So basically using this old experience a lot of times. So trying to figure out exactly how to trade off, do I spend compute getting new data with a simulation versus do I spend compute reusing my old data, which may not be, you know, exactly current how do I trade that off? But in, in any of these cases, just having faster compute is going to be helpful. And just being able to go from 10 to 1,000 cores, just being able to paralyze is going to make things incredibly much faster. Cool. And to, to connect this with, uh, with some of our intro story, uh, when you say... Uh, Simulator in the in the examples with uh, with the game playing that uh, that we've uh, briefly discussed, this is the game itself. Right? That's so right. This and is it, Pong or Dota. Exactly, and it, it could be it could be a MATLAB simulation, which is it c can be extremely fast, or it can be Dota, which is much much slower. But in and in all those cases, the faster you can get the simulation going, the faster you're going to be able to learn. And there's and and in the case of the stock market, uh, this would usually be the stock market itself, sort of, or or uh, it seems like it would be incredibly difficult to simulate. That's right. So there, there's a uh, there's a few approaches to that. What one would be use a stock market simulation. You know it's not correct, but maybe it's good enough to be useful. You could make live trades in the stock market, which is is obviously true, but could be expensive. And then there's also the idea of just um, backtracing, looking at past data and running it forward. So the and the problem with that is you essentially only have one trajectory because IBM on July 1st had one price. Doesn't matter how many times you go through that data, it's still going to have that same price on July 1. Right, right. And it seems uh, seems to a layman like my, myself that. Uh, capturing uh, dynamics along the lines of how stock the stock market reacts to your decision um, is is particularly difficult right so it's, I've, I've heard that in these uh, uh, real kind of production high frequency trading platforms a lot of the decisions are are made with the expectation that there's going to be a non-trivial reaction to the move that's being made uh, so I, I guess this sort of thing is, uh, something that you either choose to spend a lot of money on uh, or, or kind of capture in some kind of uh, observation-based simulation that, that you implement in your, uh, uh, in your sandbox. Overall, this, this RBC example sounds uh, really fascinating. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that there's probably a lot of secrecy about what, uh, you, you know, what's, what's actually happening in that, in that trading agent, but uh, in many ways it sounds almost uh, more interesting than the 
uh, than the gaming ones. What what could be more interesting than the video games? What do you mean? <laughs> well, but it's I, a technical problem. I, I mean, uh, the video games, as much as they're slow, at least it puts something that's a closed system that's completely uh, under your control, or you, you can kind of experiment with it endlessly and see what happens. Yeah. Well, and there in in a video game, the the simulator you're working with is the ground truth. And one of one of the hot topics in reinforcement learning is this idea of sim to real. So if I want to train a robot, if I want to train a stock stock trading agent, maybe I want to learn in a simulator first. That simulator will not be correct. It is not going to be perfect. The, the more accurate it is the better. But given that it's not going to be perfect, how can I learn it in simulation and then deploy into the real world? Or can I even make it a process? I learn in simulation, deploy in the real world, and then update my simulator so that it's more realistic. And uh, Peter Stone from UT Austin has been doing some great stuff with this kind of interactive going from the simulation to the real world and back. That's amazing. So you, you mentioned this uh, inherent um, sort of uh, trade-off that exists in the system where you, you have a, a, a simulator or, or an object that's representative of uh, of uh, the environment that your your agent operates in and the effects that the decisions by the let's call it control system, um, which is the the, the other half of uh, of this picture makes, and then there's the control system or the control logic, which which includes observing the environment for a while. Uh, it includes making decisions ba based off of those observations and goals that are encoded in the system, and. Uh, a part of this is neural nets. Uh, I get the sense that there's often parts that are not necessarily neural nets. And there's, a, there's essentially this very distinct uh, bifurcation where the simulation is determined by, you know, what, what your goals are and what, what your system is trying to do. And it could be games, it could be stock market dynamics, it could be uh, capturing behavior of mechanical systems like robot arms if you're uh, if if that's what you're trying to to uh, control and then on the other hand is this artificial uh, intelligence essentially your control system um, in uh, in in a box and uh, you made a very good example where the if the simulator is dota it's a pretty heavy piece of computation to be done in every time step and uh, it's easy for even someone like me to imagine that uh, it might kind of uh, easily dwarf uh, or, or outmatch the amount of computation needed for, for the control. Whereas in other cases, the, the simulation might be uh, relatively simple and the control portion might be quite, quite difficult. So to me, the image that this evokes is that it would be ideal if you had a, a compute fabric, which is able to, to sort of, uh, which is able to, to effectively execute both types of work. And if you had uh, an oracular a sort of meta control system which controls the percentage of that fabric that's assigned to the to the simulator versus the the percentage that's that's assigned to the control system. Uh, this would be very. This seems like it would be a nice fit uh, with this kind of heterogeneity uh, that, that's inherent to your work. And um, by my understanding today, a lot of the computer machinery that's in in modern data centers. Uh, or on, on people's desks for, for that matter, is sort of clearly broken down into components uh, that, that are viewed as kind of dense high throughput computation, which usually is a GPU today or a set of GPUs, or uh, less dense, but much more nimble computation machinery, which would be in the, the CPU portion of the system. So does this hard boundary in the hardware cause you to need to make uncomfortable decisions as, as you go about building up these systems? It has, has this uh, popped up as a, uh, as a problem that has registered as, as something that's kind of a, uh, on a scale between an annoyance and a serious problem uh, for you and the folks that you work with? So for, for us, it's more something that we, we just take for granted and don't really think about. So if I've, if I've got an environment and I've got an agent I just run the thing. And you know, if, if the simulation is really slow, I just, oh well, or if my agent is really slow, I guess I just wait longer. But you're absolutely right. If there was a more dynamic way that you could shift compute between the simulator and the agent, 
or if, if you had multiple agents, that would be another place where you would want to shift the compute around so that the entire set of agents was to learn as fast as possible. But what, one other thing that I think is, is a similar to supervised learning, but I think we might suffer from even more, is that we are always running many trials in parallel. So it's never just, oh, I'm going to run an agent and, and it's going to learn Atari. No, instead, well, if I want to get a good result, I've got to run this agent on 10 versions of Atari and then take the average. But in, in reality, I'm not going to run 10 times. I've got to do a neural architecture search. I've got to do a hyperparameter search. So if I'm going to show one result that's the average of 10 runs, I might have to do 1,000 runs to get there. So then, then you've got this question. If I have a finite amount of compute, how do I decide to break up the compute between the simulator and the agent? Or how many parallel simulator agent pairs do I want running so that I can most quickly crank through these, these thousand runs? And, and there's always the, of course, oh, well, maybe after a hundred runs, I realize that actually I've already found a good parameter. Let's cut everything off. So it's it's variable amount number of runs. So th there's kind of this this meta optimization going on that if if the hardware was to be more dynamic, I bet we could run experiments a whole lot faster. So uh, listening to you speak made me remember some terminology that one of my mentors um, uh, introduced uh, a long while ago, and it's he sort of splits the the world of uh, parallel computing into two subcategories. One is uh, designed to run. Uh, what uh, what he coined is uh, found parallelism, and another uh, which is designed to run uh, what he coined is uh, given parallelism. And um, the the way this maps to to what you just said to me is that you have a number of agents uh, in 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 only one instance of of your system. It sounded like these agents are oftentimes identical, right? So like, or they're kind of. Uh, they're either identical or similar. There's some degree of homogeneity in, in how they, uh, they're modeled and, and how they execute. Uh, so one, one sort of source of given parallelism is that you've, you've got a bunch of agents that you, you might want to uh, learn and play out uh, in parallel. And then you, you might take the results that each produced and combine them in some way to get a more, more statist statistically correct picture for whatever the next move of the global system is, right? And then I guess there's another layer to the whole story where you can instantiate the entire system uh, a multitude of times and run many, many more experiments that way. And again, you combine them in, in some way, uh, either you combine them by, by just a type of averaging or else you, you, you learn uh, via hyperparameter exploration, more promising configurations of the system. And then as, as you go through this, uh, as, as this process unfolds, you, you sort of converge on, onto, uh, onto something that's close to final that you basically take all the way through and, and uh, this is what you deploy as, as a solution at the end of the process. Is, is this a, a reasonable mental image of, of the whole thing? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Because you've got the the high level doing the hyperparameter tuning neural architecture search. Then you've got the, I've got to run a bunch of experiments to get statistical significance. And then one layer lower than that is some of these agents are designed to be parallelized. So you do have agents that are actually designed to have uh, multi-threads running at the same time. Maybe all of them are interacting with different environments. Maybe some are acting with the environment and some are uh, reusing past data. So you actually have these kind of three levels of potential parallelization. And then from the standpoint of how easy it is to, to sort of uh, do uh, any or, or all of this, uh, you have the question where, I guess, if, if you're simulating something like Dota, you need to be able to, to start many copies of Dota across many sets of hardware as things stand today. And then you need to kind of do the same with, with the, other, uh, the other half of the story, the, the control system. I'm trying to connect this with how, um, how things are done in supervised learning today where uh, the same kind of problem uh, exists and, and the same observations, many of the same observations are true in that they also run uh, architecture search. They also like to, to spawn many copies of, of, uh, of, let's say a training process, perhaps with different parameters, oftentimes with the same ones in, in data parallel training. So for supervised learning, 
a good deal of infrastructure has sprung up that enables one to spawn many copies of a model with differing or identical hyperparameters on one machine or across many machines tied, uh, tied, by, tied by a computer network. Uh, so long as you don't get too ambitious with the way you, you do the parallelization and you really keep it to just spawning many copies of, of things, it's almost kind of something that you click a button and it sort of works. So like it's, it, it's hit that level of, of maturity and trying to imagine your system where you, you have a, these distinctly sort of separate pieces of programming where one of them in the case of Dota or in the case of the stock market really. And most examples save the, the open AI gym and, and similar infrastructure that, that you mentioned earlier. It's really something that doesn't lend itself to, to kind of uh, being started and cleaned up and managed by PyTorch as, as things stand. What do you guys do? Like the, does every group have, have its own set of infrastructure and there's folks who maintain and, and evolve all this stuff or is there some, some common standards that, uh, that have sprung up? So a, a, a common theme in we've seen reinforcement learning is, boy, that seems simpler in supervised learning. So there, there really isn't that, that same ability right now to just kind of plug and play, click a button and go parallelize. So for, for instance, uh, 15 years ago, I was working where a hundred agents would train at once. So we spawned up a hundred environments, a hundred agents on a hundred different computers that we would wait until they all finished, come back together and then use evolutionary algorithms to update those agents and then send them out again. And the way we did that was with a ton of bash scripts. It was not pretty, it was a one-off thing and you would probably want to write it from scratch instead of reusing it. But if we were able to come up with more plug and play methods, for, for, exa for example, in OpenAI Gym, if we were able to you know, just send it out and this worked. So in, in Canada, we have the Compute Canada infrastructure. Um, so if we, we had a way of every student using Compute Canada could just press this button, or if we were able to optimize for a few different types of HPCs, you know, that, that would be that extra level of accessibility that would, again, remove barriers, get, make it easier for people to use, to use these tools, and through parallelization, get results so much quicker than having to, you know, hand, either do it in serial because you're just working on your own machine or having to hand code all of these tools and helpers that you need in order to kind of organize this. Cool. So it sounds like th there's been a great deal of progress uh, there as well between, uh, you know, b between the, the collection of bash scripts and, uh, and, and some of the more, more, more recent things that you, that you describe. All of this makes me imagine uh, uh, from, from, from my kind of uh, angle to, to, to this discussion, which is uh, uh, from the viewpoint uh, of, of somebody who's who spent most of their life designing computers uh, for, for various types of work. This makes me uh, think that really a data center full of replicated uh, homogenous computing machinery uh, where every node is able to, to both do uh, sort of programmatic code uh, that, that's more fit for, for a CPU in, in today's CPU, GPU worldview, as well as able to, to switch into, into accelerating uh, dense math, uh, depending on what's, what's required at the time, uh, and connected in, in, in a way that's, that's pretty flexible, that allows for, for kind of flexibly defining islands, which are working on simulation versus computation heavy things with the ability to instantiate multiple copies of the entire system or, or kind of simulators or, uh, or agents flexibly and to set up communication flow that fits uh, basically every one of these paradigms sounds like an ideal compute substrate. Uh, and uh, on top of that, if, if a mechanism was present that could somehow track in real time the complexity of simulation versus versus uh, control and reassign these resources, that would kind of be uh, uh, the ideal holy grail solution as, as, as nebulous as, uh, as it sounds. I think that um, the way we've gone about designing our machinery actually isn't hugely far from that. So uh, we essentially have implemented uh, compute blocks which contain five CPUs in, in a in an accelerator for math and set it up such that uh, 
you can map computation onto one or groups of these things. And if the computation is very programmatic, like running Dota, for example, it would run more on the CPUs. And if it's if it's a neural net and very heavy in um, in math, it would be making use of the accelerators more. The multiple copies of things imply that you 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 would like to set up a sort of broadcast and gather mechanisms where if you've made a decision and you want to relay that same decision to multiple agents, there's an efficient way to send it to all of them that doesn't consist of just resending it a bazillion times. And that uh, th th there's a fairly, fairly efficient way to collect data from all the agents and put it together. So that uh, in supervised learning, the way this, uh, th th this, this story manifests as, uh, as uh, or something similar to it show, shows up during gradient updates of, of parallelized training where you collect multiple sets of weights that were updated by, by multiple, you know, parallel executing models. And then you, you need to, uh, you know, you, I think mostly people just average them nowadays, but you can kind of think of it as some kind of function of combining them together and producing one set, which, which seems like it might be a better, you know, better fit to what happens in, in RL. So that's actually caused a, a, a good deal of uh, evolution in, in hardware to support. So uh, network switch silicon manufacturers have put in features where you're able to, to take these weights that are arriving from multiple copies of the model and combine them in the switch. So in a sense, you've, you've taken the, uh, you take this problem, which is kind of math in, you know, at, at, at the core of it, you're, you're gonna run a mathematical function that takes many inputs and produces one. Uh, but uh, they, they've kind of managed to factor this particular piece of math in together with the data movement as, as opposed to, to running it on the processors. And that's, that's yielded some, some efficiencies. To me, it sounds like this, the, the ability to do this sort of thing might, might benefit uh, RL as well when you describe these systems where many agents are, are running and then you want to collect a, a bunch of data and really summarize it in some way and cause it to, to make a state change in the, in the central controller. Do you sometimes have multiple controllers that are, that are somehow being voted or combined uh, to, yep. to uh, influence what the agents do? Yeah, so just like in, in supervised learning, you can have ensemble methods where you have multiple classifiers and you kind of stick them together in some way to make a decision. You can absolutely have multiple agents or, or, or sub-agents that are interacting with each other and then producing one action. So they all see the states, they, they think about it, they talk about it, and then they decide what action should actually be executed. Briefly going back to the dynamic, I, I really like that idea of, of balancing the CPU versus parallelized parallelized uh, systems. And if you had the, so I have colleagues that would know exactly what to, what type of code to put on each of those. I personally would benefit much more from saying, I want to run this thing. Can you figure out what should go on the, the GPU like thing versus the CPU? I think that that would be amazing and make, make it things that much more accessible. Yeah. No, it sounds like uh, it's, it sounds like a neat way of not causing needless, you know, wait times. Cause uh, I guess if, if you have a disbalance, that means the one side of the equation is by analogy calculated quickly. And the other side is you, and, and then the machinery dedicated to it is essentially waiting idle while the other is, is working. This sort of thing is very easy to observe. So it's literally a matter of setting up uh, participating processors so that they count the time that they spend idle. And uh, if you have uh, massive disbalances in, 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 these, uh, in these idle observations, uh, I can imagine a relatively simple control system that, uh, that is gonna migrate work from, um, from, from one half of this, this mental, mental image to, to the other up until you achieve a balance. Um, essentially, and uh, so long as as the dynamics of this situation don't change within the within the single simulation too much, it's pretty easy to uh, pretty easy to lock in. So if if you have a a fixed balance like you know Dota always takes, let's say a millisecond to calculate uh, uh, a time step, and and your controller always takes a second, uh, and this doesn't doesn't violently uh, change time step to time step, it's, it's an easy thing to do so long as the underlying compute substrate is, uh, 
uh, is to uh, tolerant of, of dynamically reassigning resources. We could probably do that on on uh, on top of the uh, the hardware that that we built. That would be awesome. Yeah. And then go, going back to the idea of having multiple agents, you could absolutely have some of those agents which were doing kind of trivial calculations and others that were doing deep neural networks. In some cases, the requirements of the agents might change over time. So for instance, if you are saving a lot of data, uh, instead of always interacting with the environment, if you're saving some past interactions, as you get more and more of these interactions, you might become a bit slower. You might slow down just because there's more data to reason about, but it should be a gradual kind of thing and it should not be these violent reversals. And, and if you are able to, to respond to that online if, with, with some kind of control system, being able to uh, fairly allocate the available resources, that I could see that being very impactful. And uh, at, at the level of, of uh, the actual math that's being computed as, as part of the controller, especially, uh, I wanted to ask a couple of, of, of fairly low level questions. One, one is, uh, uh, is sparsity uh, a factor? Like, is, is there a lot of sparse math? A sub question there is uh, same exact question, but as it pertains to things that are fixed. Uh, so like some coefficients that don't change that are inherent to the problem that you're dealing with and there's there's a sparse matrix that's that's kind of representing those and it doesn't evolve it's just you know sparse you know, in, in a static way that can be handled uh, offline as you're writing code or as you're compiling your code uh, versus uh, more dynamic uh, manifestations of sparsity that are sort of manifestations of things that are happening in your system as as the dynamics of it unfold uh, so th th that was one question. And then the, the other one uh, that I, I really wasn't able to find uh, uh, an easy answer to online is uh, how much does latency matter? So these questions like big batch versus little batch versus no batch from, from the supervised world, how does this stuff uh, show up in, in reinforcement learning and how important it is? The immediate response is, I have no idea, but I'm happy to make an informed guess. So I won't, I won't spend too much time since this is uh, partially speculation, but I will say that, so for instance, when you play Atari, one of the, the first things you do is you go through a convolutional uh, neural network. So you've got some, some layers and you're, so whatever the CNN people are doing to optimize, RL should absolutely be able to steal. So I would expect there are places where there, where there is sparsity. There's also some places where there might not be. It really depends on the, the structure of the agent, but also the structure of the environment. What are the inputs it's getting? How is it interacting with them? The, the part 1B um, was thinking about the fixed versus dynamic. And there, so again, thinking about if I've got this CNN that is working over pixels. And then on top of this, I have this agent that is using a deep neural network to say from this interpretation for the pixels, how do I act? In some cases, you can freeze that representation. So you freeze that convolutional neural network, and then you just learn, given this fixed representation, how do I learn to optimize over that? So there could be cases where you do have this kind of, something is dynamic and something is frozen. That's particularly can be uh, useful in multitask or transfer learning settings. So in, you might be able to come up with a general CNN that works across lots of different Atari games and you're only changing the control that goes on top of that fixed CNN. So that, that would be one example of that fixed versus dynamic. And the last thing you were talking about latency and batch size. I'm, I'm not sure I really understood the question. So in, in supervised learning, you can think about, you know, am I gonna do a, a bunch of stuff and then make quick changes or I'm gonna do it slowly. In reinforcement learning, a lot of it is thinking about interacting with a simulator. So if, if I can make incremental changes to the agent as soon as I get the data, then I'm probably going to be getting better and better policies over time. However, if I change too fast, then I might become unstable. And there can be advantages to running a fixed agent for a while, getting that uh, data and then updating everything in a large batch mode. And a lot of that, again, comes back to the simulator, but also the assumptions of the algorithm. Because in some, in some algorithms, that kind of batch updating is critical. In others, it's not, it's not so much. 
So I think I think you could you could come up with settings and with algorithms that could benefit from from both the very fast bat, low latency updating, as well as the slow more batch processing. Understood. So the the, the image that I got is as you were describing that is is kind of one where it might be helpful to to uh, to run the simulator and the and the agent that's interacting with it on on separate time basis or at different sample rates almost. And, and uh, so you might essentially produce a single output out of the agent and, and keep it uh, keep it as the input to the simulator for 10 time steps. And that might be good because there, there's some uh, stability that's being introduced uh, in terms of, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, I guess they're, they're, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at, uh, at that because uh, I get afraid that if I get deeper, I'm going to say something that's patently wrong, right? But uh, essentially, no, that's exactly the right idea. So you could have a fixed agent that has a fixed way of acting, let it run with a simulator for a bunch. Then once I have that data, let's go back and update the way the agent acts. Right. And then in, in, in other cases, uh, fast uh, response is, is better. And, uh, you know, I guess the the classical control system way of measuring this stuff was uh, was this concept of phase delay through uh, phase shift through the loop, right? And and uh, people usually wanted to minimize that uh, with with classical applications like the the, the motor control. And uh, but I guess again from from a hardware person standpoint, this sounds like flexibility is what's desired. And if you can kind of do well with uh, uh, with you know batch one uh, lowest possible latency. As well as do well, uh, you know, with uh, with batched execution, that would be the ideal scenario. Absolutely, because it's, uh, if you tell an RL person, okay, tell me what simulator and algorithm you're using, that RL person can typically say, yes, it needs really low latency. You're running in batches, fine. And if they have the option to use that same hardware that could maximize both of those, that would be amazing. Right. Right. Yeah. No. That 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 sounds. Uh, uh, that sounds right. Of course, it's challenging. There, there there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of hardware level trade offs that uh, are fairly profound that are driven by a desire for low latency versus not. Uh, essentially, as things stand today, systems designed for one and systems that that were aiming at uh, you know at the other end of the spectrum look quite different. Uh, I think a, a number of groups have tried to 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 uh, find a good middle ground, find something that uh, that achieves uh, decent success at both both sides, and uh, I think that that's been a goal for for the architecture work that we've been doing as well. And um, so, Professor Taylor, we're uh, we're actually uh, almost a full hour in, uh, which it, it went by a lot uh, a, a lot quicker uh, than than I expected. And uh, uh, I'd like to to ask you one one more question uh, while we still have time, and that's. Uh, how do you imagine the next couple of years uh, of RL? What, what do you think the you know the, the next big thing is? And uh, as a, as a sub sub question to that, uh, does that change at all if you uh, could somehow wave a magic wand and get a get a endless and absolutely perfect computation for for the experiments that uh, that you and your team uh, are envisioning? Yeah. So I think there, there's kind of three parts. The first one is we're working on making algorithms more efficient. So using less data through human knowledge, through uh, tricks, through better exploration. And that just makes reinforcement learning more applicable. There's also going to be, I believe, there's going to be many more big breakthroughs, especially from companies like DeepMind and OpenAI, because they have these huge compute resources. They can throw so much compute at problems that they can solve things that no one else can solve, really pushing forward what is possible. Now, if our hardware gets better, we're going to see more companies, more researchers be able to tackle larger problems. And that's gonna be particularly important for companies that just can't afford endless compute. If they can purchase um, more efficient compute, then they might be able to solve problems that are just infeasible now. So if we are able to push forward the accessibility and lower the price 
um, improve the throughput of compute, I really think that's going to help bring reinforcement learning out of video games, out of academic labs, and into the hands of people that can use it to directly make the world better. That That is my... That is my optimistic prediction, which just goes against everything 2020 has taught us. But but I'm gonna I'm gonna stay hopeful. I think that's absolutely the way to go. I mean, uh, uh, op optimism is is uh, is absolutely crucial to 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 progress in in almost uh, almost everything good in life, right? So I, I I choose to to always take take the optimistic viewpoint and. Uh, if they, if 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 everybody feels that way, uh, uh, I almost think that it can, uh, it can end up uh, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, uh, I hope that uh, the field is going to accelerate even further. That we're going to see uh, many more things, like your example from RBC, where where it's it's actually being applied to uh, to problems that uh, that are de decidedly real world and uh, and uh, where repercussions of of uh, mistakes are quite serious. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion with you. I want to thank you again for, for taking the time to, to talk to me. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Absolutely, Lubisha. I, I really enjoyed speaking with you well, as well. And I look forward to figuring out if there are ways that reinforcement learning can use the hardware you currently have, or if there's ways that you might be able to shape development in the future to make RL even that much better on your hardware. Yeah, I, I look forward to to working together on um, on on those questions. And I, as 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 an optimist, like uh, like we just concluded, uh, uh, I'm hoping that we're gonna we're gonna figure out a way to uh, to, to to make RL go quicker and uh, realize this vision uh, that that you just outlined. Great, let's do it. Thanks, man.